Calvary Baptist Church listeners. I'm recording this for a future Wednesday evening, so I'm told. I had actually presented this in 2010 for a Wednesday night evening prayer meeting. And this is based on Acts 17, 16 through 33. So I'm going to read the text. You can follow along or just listen. Acts 17, 16 through 33. Now while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the uh, Areop Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious, for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you, God, who made the heaven and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with man's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the, all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times in the borders of boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they may grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art in man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands, now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance to this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, why others said, We will hear again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed, among them Dionysus in the area of Gite, a woman named Damaris, and others with him. So we find Paul in Athens, and he uh, came over, and he's waiting for Silas and Timothy to join him, and he also uh, they ran into uh, some problems with the Jews in Berea, and also Paul had had a vision of a man calling out to him, come over to Macedonia. So he's there waiting. He had commanded uh, Silas and, and Timothy to come over as quick as they could, and says that his spirit was provoked or aroused or agitated uh, because of all the temples and, and idols he had seen in, in Athens. He said that the the city was covered with idols and temples, some say up to 2,000. It's given over to idols, so Athens was just awash in idols. And uh, his concern produced action. He wasn't just sitting around idle waiting for Silas and Timothy to show up. It says that he reasoned in the synagogue, which was a common practice of his, and in the marketplace daily. Paul was a tent maker by trade. I don't know if he was doing that. But he was always where there's a concentration of people, like going to the farmer's market or setting up a booth at the field days or the harbor fest. And he was always engaging with people. That was Paul's M.O. And uh, 
Paul has a welcome here in verses 18 through 21. It says that some met him, met him with contempt. They call they call him a babbler, and this has the idea of a rag picker. He has scraps of knowledge insinuating that he might be a plagiarist and that he had nothing originally to say. Uh, some people have determined before they even hear what's said that they're not going to agree or accept it. Um, you know, they don't want to give anybody a fair hearing. Uh, but he's also welcomed with courtesy in verse 19. Some say, uh, may we know, we want to know what this strange teaching is. So he has two audiences, one that's interested and the other one that could care less. They're not going to listen. So things really haven't changed much. And there's a couple of groups of people that are mentioned here. <clears throat> and uh, first these uh, Epicureans, and this uh, group had a view that the universe was a product of chance, that the goal of life is happiness attained through reasoning. They did not deny the existence of God, but they did not believe he had anything to do with man. So he was an impersonal God. And they promoted a life of luxury and indulgence. And of course, that always degrades to uh, sensuality. There's another group, the Stoics, that's mentioned, and they're uh, pantheistic. The idea that a spark of divinity was present in everything. Uh, God is everything and everything is God. The Stoics were impassionate <clears throat> and self-reliant. Life had no particular direction or destiny. And Americans often have that frontier image of themselves, like John Wayne, you know, we just do the right manly thing, you know, no moralizing here, just give me the facts, man. Uh, and then he mentions the uh, Ari, Ari, Ariopacus, and this was a council of Athens. They oversaw religious and moral and educational matters. They thought themselves as the custodian of truth and teaching. And it was a judicial body. They made decisions. Um, and also the uh, Areopagus is an outcropping of rock northwest of the uh, Acropolis. So it's a group and it's also a location. Uh, and Anna, Anna and I were there in 2010 with the APW uh, Travel Club. And it was awesome because, you know, you're standing where Paul once stood when he was proclaiming the gospel. Uh, there's also a plaque on the rock, and I think it was commer commemorating the occasion of Paul's visit, but it was in Greek. Um, there's also graffiti sp spray painted on the rock. And I have to say that Athens, I thought, was a dirty city. And then there's the Acropolis, and that's the that's at the top of the hill from the uh, Areopagus, <clears throat> and uh, it it, was, it meant in Greek it meant the the hill of Arius. Uh, it, for the Romans, they called it the Hills of Mars, or Mars Hill. Uh, it's the site of the Parthenon, which is an incredible ancient structure. Uh, and we walked up through from the uh, Areopagus to the top of the hill through the Nike Gate, and you sneaker fans know about Nike, um, and that means victory. So it was the victory gate. So when uh, armies came back, ceremonially they'd come up through the gate, into the Parthenon at the top of the hill. So the Parthenon and other temples, and uh, there was a very well-preserved uh, amphitheater. And this was built around uh, 447 to 432 BC. So it's approximately 2,500 years old. Greece has the perfect weather for preserving buildings of antiquity because it's hot and dry in Mediterranean. He, Paul also mentions uh, an inscription to the unknown God. Some, some say a better rendition is to the unnamed God. And the citizens of Greece may not want it to offend a God that they hadn't missed, you know, they had missed or overlooked or they were unaware of. So they're like covering all their bases to have a temple to the unknown God. And Paul has his witness here. In verses 22 through 28, Paul took the opportunity given him to speak. And he starts formally and polite. Uh, they're all very religious, uh, he observes. So he, you know, he's not offensive. He's not calling them names, pagans or fools or being superstitious. The attempt to find God is a constant human endeavor. So their motives, you know, may have been noble. And what man needs 
<clears throat> is the truth of the gospel, not religion. He needs a relationship, not a religion. People need to practice faith, not a religion. And there is an object to our faith, a faith based on truthful revelation. It's not some feel good towards something out there type of thing. You know, just have a positive outlook and that will bring you salvation. People need to lose their religion and gain Christ. With the Jews in the synagogue, Paul would argue that Jesus was the Messiah, but with the Athenians, he had to uh, take them back to the beginning, to creation. And at, at one point, CBC supported missionaries to the Philippines, Robert and Valerie Petro. And while they were on the field, Bob contracted blood poisoning and died. I mean, it was tragic. And we continue to support Valerie and her two kids for another year until she came back to the States and got established. And they were with the mission board, ABWE. And I remember Bob saying that they were using New Tribes mission material. Now New Tribes goes by Enthos 360. And that material started in Genesis and went all the way through the Old Testament and taught all the way through the New Testament because the, the people, the tribe that they were dealing with, witnessing to had no biblical background or knowledge uh, of the Old Testament. Uh, and we see that here with the Greeks. Paul taught in the synagogues. When he, when he taught in the synagogues to the Jews, he could show Jesus as the Messiah through the Psalms and through the prophets, since the Jews subscribed to those writings. But he had to take, he had to take it to the beginning with the, uh, his audience that day. So he claims... He states that God is the creator. In verse 24, he says, God who made the earth and everything in it. So God existed before all. The Bible also tells us that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen are not made of things which are visible. He also states that Paul, uh, God is transcendent. Verse 24, he says, and he is Lord of heaven and earth. God is above and distinct from his creation. Creation just testifies of his greatness, but he is not his creation. God, Paul states, is also omnipresent. In verse 24, he says, he does not dwell in temples made with hands. First Kings 8, 27 says, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built? In Isaiah 66, 1 says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me, and where is the place of my rest? For all these things my hands have made, and all these things exist, says the Lord. God cannot be contained on a shelf or worn around our necks. He can't be reduced to a thing or an object. He's not some lucky charm. Paul also informs them that uh, God is self-sufficient. In verse 25, he says, Nor is he worshipped with man's hands as though he needs anything. God needs nothing outside himself. He's complete and lacks nothing. Man's following, worship, and honor does not add or diminish anything to his nature or character. He is never less or more than he already is. I think I was quoting A.W. Tozer there. He cannot be represented by anything made by man. And God is the giver of all things. God didn't give us the sun so we could worship it, but to benefit from it. It was a gift for growth and energy and health. Idols supposedly exert their power through their image. Um, God is not an object or a thing like a man-made idol. He's self-sufficient. He's also sovereign. In verse 26, Paul states that uh, he made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. God made one humanity through Adam. God made one race, the human race. The Greeks were not superior as they thought. They thought they were you know, way above intellectually and culturally above all the other peoples. God raises up nations when he decided and placed them where he wanted in certain geographical locations. He uses them according to his purpose and will. And I've given this some thought. And uh, the picture could be of God moving people and nations and boundaries like 
pieces on a chessboard. But in all our actions, we're culpable and accountable. So it's more complicated than God pulling strings on a puppet. While we're exercising our free will in actions, God is simultaneously orchestrating providence to accomplish his will and decrees and to oversee the affairs of man. I'm sorry if that uh, disappointed, if you thought you were going to get the fuller explanation of how the universe works, but that's the best I got. Paul also tells them in his witness that God is personal. Verse 27 through 29, he says, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of our own some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Paul here quotes uh, a Greek writer because these specific words reflect the biblical truth, and by using them he could build a, a bridge to his pagan audience. Uh, usually one would quote Aristotle or Plato or Socrates, but Paul quotes some minor Greek writer, which shows the extent of his education and scholarship, you know, and plus he was a lawyer and a, and a Pharisee. He's, you know, one bright guy, one prepared guy from, from God. He's not showing off his education, but he's using an appropriate quote. Paul never is superfluous or flashy to impress others. His speech is never fluff or flattery, and he never tries to draw attention to himself. He's all about the gospel and the glory of God, just as is preaching here in this account. Paul uses the quote, for we are also his offspring. All men are God's creation, and anyone can sire offspring, but to be considered father and son requires a relationship. Our relationship with our Heavenly Father is based on faith in the new birth. John 1, 12 through 13 says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. And those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And Galatians 3.26 tells us, For you are all sons through God, through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone. If God was gold, silver, or stone, we, as his offspring, wouldn't we be gold, silver, and stone? Instead, we're made in the image of God. We are God's image bearer. And Paul gives a warning here in verses uh, 29 through 31. He says, man must repent. Verse 29 says, God now com commands all men everywhere to repent. In times past, God overlooked I don't think he winked at sin, but he left man to his own devices and destruction. Acts 14, 14 through 17 says, But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran to, ran in among the multitude, crying out, saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, and to preach to you should turn from these useless things, idols, to the living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea, and all things are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own way. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness, in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven in fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So in this epic, this is the time for repentance. It says in time past, he overlooked things. Uh, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. And he left men to their own devices and destruction. But now is the time of repentance. And of course, repent means to change one's mind, uh, change their course, and to, and to turn the other way. It's more than just reforming or cleaning up our act. It's turning away from sin and turning to the Lord. So men must repent and man will be judged. In verse 31, he says, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man who he has ordained. So man is accountable. 
for his actions, for his deeds, for his speech. Hebrews 9.27 says, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after that is the judgment. Sin was judged in the person and work of Jesus Christ that was approved and accepted by God and that he raised him from the dead bodily and he is now clothed in a judicial authority. John three seventeen through 21 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light because their e deeds are evil. For anyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they may be done in God. And in verse 31, Paul emphasizes Christ's humanity, and I'm sure later he'll cover Christ's divinity, uh, in another discourse with, with the Greeks, but one, one lesson at a time. And finally, we have Paul's winnings um, in verses 32 to 33. It says that some mocked and some believed. And you might think, well, hey, that sounds like 50-50. You know, 50 mocked, 50 believed. But I, I don't think so. Um, and I think I've mentioned this before. I have an unscientific guesstimation that... Uh, at any given time, the population of the world is 5% born-again, true-believing Christians. So if there's 100 people in the audience, maybe only five believe. And that would be a good core for of believers to start a local church, right? Five people, that's great. Uh, it does sound like there were some conversions that day, and most likely more to follow. Uh, some wanted to hear more from Paul about the unknown God. Uh, it says that, however, some men joined him and believed, among them uh, Dionysus, the Areogite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. And uh, thank God for believing women who come to faith. And I just wanted to sum this up with uh, by reading another uh, passage of Scripture. I always thought this was powerful, kind of uh, summarizes what... Uh, the passage in Acts was talking about. And I became familiar with this from the movie Chariots of Fire where the uh, 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 Olympian who didn't want to compete on Sunday, I think he preached this from the pulpit. And this is Isaiah 44, 21 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its hab inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth, when he will also blow on them, and they will wither and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom, then, will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and see who has created these things, who brings out their hosts by number, who calls them by name, by the greatness of his might, and the, pow and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He has given power to the weak, and to those who have no might he increases strength. Even the youth shall pass and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Please pray with me. Lord, we, we thank you for this uh, brief time we have to look into your word. We thank you that you've left us your revelation, that we don't have to uh, 
fumble around to know what things are about and what we should do. We ask your protection through this uh, strange time. Watch over our families and our homes and our health. We pray for you to continue to provide for us, to, to shower your goodness upon us. Pray for anybody that might have needs in our congregation. We pray that they would reach out so that other hands could help. Uh, we just look forward to coming again together in the parking lot on uh, Sunday. Be with Pastor as he preaches. And Lord, we, we look for, forward to that day that we all might meet together in one place and, and see each other and be able to lift our voices together and praise to you. Give us a good day now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.